A long time ago, um, I was in a bookstore. I was, um, well, when I bought it, actually, I just finished my PhD dissertation for the University of Cambridge. And um, I had, um, I used to buy books at a place called, my favorite bookstore in the whole world is called University Place Books, which no longer exists at 821 Broadway in Chelsea, right, you know, at NYU, near the NYU campus. And um, it was run by an old communist named Walter Goldberg and his sidekick, a younger man uh, named William French. And if you go upstairs to Afro-Am after this lecture, you'll see in the, we have nine prizes that we give. And some of us created a prize in honor of William French because he was a fantastic uh, bibliophile and bibliographer of Afro-Americana and, to a lesser extent, Africana. Um, and I love this guy. I mean, he was kind of, he always looked unkempt. He's sort of like a, a relic from the unwashed 60s, late 60s. Uh, but he knew the hell out of the African-American tradition. And in fact, he published a couple of bibliographies. Um, and so I, we were, I was just, I would, whenever I was in New York and could go, I would go. And then I would uh, buy rare books from them, completely dust-covered, uh, disheveled um, bookstore. You can't even imagine what it looked like, just clutter. But he knew where everything was. And um, so I, I just, you know, I would just wander through the shelves. And I, there was a book, and it had this title, Iron Nig. And so I got it off the, the shelf, and I, um, I asked him about it. And he said, um, you know, some people, a couple of bibliographers have said that the author's black, but it's a load of rubbish. Um, she's white. But I bought it anyway, and it, you know, it was, I don't know, 50 or $75, I can't remember, but it's in my introduction. Um, I bought it because I was, at that time, and remain, interested in racist representations of black people. And I thought that with a copyright date of 1859, this was probably the first time the word nigger or um, derivation or, or, or diminution of the word nigger appeared in, in a title. So I thought this would be an, an historic text. And so I just put it on the shelf. I didn't even read it. You know, I just bought it. Um, a while later, when I was going through my sort of postpartum de depression from having completed my dissertation, I, um, I needed something to do. I just looked up, and there was the book. And I opened it, and I read it. And I've written this account. And in it, on the very first page of the, the preface, the author says that she's a black woman. Now, why in the world would somebody claim to be black in 1859 if she wasn't black? With that little simple premise, um, I decided to um, proceed, and the rest is, is really uh, history. It became a phenomenon, the, the rediscovery of this text and the authentication of Harriet Adams Wilson as its author. And for reasons I still don't understand. I mean, there are lots of forces. Um, Alice Walker, Zaki Shange, Tony, um, were all emerging. For Color Girls uh, was very big. You know, we, there was a moment that was happening. And, um, I, you know, I don't know. Afro-American studies was going through a very interesting period of institutionalization at all over again in, at that time in the early 80s at the historically white research universities. And I was part of that. I was in the Afro-Am program in the English department uh, at Yale. The Yale um, press people were very interested in this discovery, and they leaked it to the Times. They gave it to the New York Times. And the next thing I knew, um, you know, I was in, I was featured in the New York Times in my picture. I was 32 years old, and I was in all these magazines. I was in People magazine, and I mean, all these magazines. I mean, everybody in the country wrote a story about um, about this finding this black woman author named Harriet Wilson. And I wasn't prepared for it. No one was prepared, prepared for it. The story, I woke up, let's say, at 8 o'clock the day that the story ran, which was in November of 82, in the Times, a copy of it's upstairs on my wall. By noon, I had 25 bids from, public, by, from publishers. Uh, I think we sold the rights for $25,000. Now, $25,000 for a 32-year-old kid in 1980, that was like a million dollars to me, man. I mean, it, I couldn't believe it. And Random House published it. And uh, they sold a zillion copies, and um, you know the rest, as they say, is history. Well, um, I had two or three people who were helping me do the research who were on my staff. I was the editor at that time of something called the Black Periodical Literature Project, which we subsequently published. 
And these were young, these were kids who were either with a BA or they were still students. And we would sit down and have strategy sessions. And then I'd go have breakfast with John Blassingay, my uh, the dear, dear friend who's dead. And it was a great historian. We had breakfast every day. And Blassingay, he called me Gate, called me the Big Gate. That's what he called me. And he was 6'8", and I'm me. And so he called me. There was a bit of irony in, in this. And I'd say, and I called him B-Man. I'd say, B-Man, you know, we can't find her here. What should we do? And he said, well, Gate, if I were you, I'd do this, I would do this, I would do this. And um, it was really quite exciting. And, and we found a lot about Harry Wilson, but the path went totally cold um, after 1863. And so I you know, published this edition. I've published a couple of essays since on the methodology that we used to, to find her and what we knew, what we didn't know, you know, what we didn't know. You know, very honest, very open kind of thing to do. Um, where there was ambiguity in evidence, we printed the ambiguity. Just to make it easier for subsequent scholars. But I was convinced that Harriet Wilson was toast after 1863. Now, Jerry Ann Bogus, whom I'll introduce um, a little bit later, uh, and some of her colleagues in New Hampshire, um, this years later, I'm at Harvard, um, contact me and they've started the Harriet Wilson Society because Harriet's from New Hampshire. And um, they decided to have a celebration and they asked me to come speak. And, uh, Jerry Ann called me one day and she said, there's this woman, I don't know if she's brilliant or if she's crazy, is what she said, but she claims to have new information on Harry Wilson. And I said, well, that's easy, she's crazy, because there ain't no new information on, on Harry <laughs> Wilson. So, you know, let's just move on. But I didn't know who the woman was. But it turns out when I found out who the woman was, I happened to have known the woman, but I didn't know who she was at that time. And um, so we had our conference, and I, I went up there one Sunday and spoke, and it was just fantastic. I mean, it was great, it was packed. And Harry Wilson is this hero, this icon in, in New Hampshire. And subsequently, the woman who had contacted Jerry Ann um, contacted me. And we had a conversation. It turned out she was an old friend of mine. It was Gabrielle Foreman. And she told me that they had found all this information. I think we actually made contact. I think I was in Bermuda. Mm -hmm. or yeah, I was in Bermuda, and I called you. And I was on my cell phone, and I just couldn't believe it. I was so excited. And she said, we found her from 1863 back... Uh, to the turn of the century. And um, so I waited for the edition to come out, which was published by Penguin. She said she'd been working with an independent scholar and genealogist named Reginald Pitts, and that they had worked this together. And um, um, I eagerly awaited um, the publication of this new edition, and I, as soon as I got it, I mean, I read it avidly. Um, um, and, you know, it was, it was there. I mean, there was so much that was good. And, and wonderful and knew about dear, dear Harriet. Um, and I was just proud. You know, I was proud that I'd been part of this process, I'm proud to have known you, I'm proud that you extended the research and, and took it to places that I never, never dreamed, uh, dreamed existed. Well, when I was confined to the house over the last three months, one day I got this package, and the return address was Foreman in California, and I knew it was from Gabrielle. And the, um, and I opened this, I didn't know what it was, and I couldn't even open it, I mean, I, I had a cast on it, so the person who was taking care of me, sort of the nurse, um, she said, you want me to open this? I said, yeah, let's open this. And she had called me and said she was sending me a gift. And um, so she took this brown paper off, and it was a Tiffany box. <laughs> So I thought, wow, man, Tiffany, that's a girl with good taste. You know, in addition to being a great scholar, she has excellent taste. You know, I had to give her a lecture, but have to pay back that money, you know, for this Tiffany thing that she's bought. But she didn't have to do that, I said, ripping the box apart. <laughs> and when I opened it, it wasn't um, a piece of cut glass from Tiffany. It was a bottle, and a green bottle. It's a little green bottle. It's about that tall. And so I, I picked it up. And on one side, I mean, it's authenticated. It was a late um, 1850s bottle with raised glass. And on one side it says Manchester, New Hampshire, on the margin, as it were, on the, the side. And on the other it says um, hairdressing. And, um, and then it has Mrs. H.E. on it. It says Mrs. H.E. Wilson's hairdressing. H.E. Wilson is how Harriet Wilson identified herself up through the time when she copyrighted uh, her book in Boston in 1859. What they had found was that Harriet Wilson had invented a hairdressing product, A. B. had her own bottles made from Manchester, New Hampshire. 
um, and C, the, of the three extant copies or bottles, or however I'm supposed to put it, I now, through the generosity of these two people, owned one. Isn't that amazing? An act of amazing generosity? It is, I don't even think they know how valuable it was. If so, they'd sneak over to my house and take a bath. <laughs> it was a really generous thing to do. And I've kept your card, which brought tears to my eyes. And believe me, at that time, I was having a really hard time just getting out of the pain, high on Percocet, which wasn't such a bad thing. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I think it's one of the most generous acts that anyone has ever um, given me or displayed to me. And I, in front of everybody, I just wanted to testify and say that. So we arranged for them to come and speak to us today. And now I will read their introductions. Gabriel Foreman is Associate Professor of English and American Studies at Occidental College, where she teaches African American literature, as well as issues of social justice. She's published numerous essays, book chapters, reviews, and critical anthologies, and academic journals such as Representations in the Yale Journal of Criticism and American Literary History. She's also received grants from the National Humanities Center, the National Research Council, the Ford Foundation, the Huntington Library, the Mellon Foundation, et cetera, et cetera. The ACLS awarded her a Graves Award for Teaching and Scholarship, and she was named a Kellogg National Leadership Fellow for her work with youth. With young activists and partners from the nonprofit sector, she co-founded ASHAYE, Ashe? Mm -hmm. Ashe, Action for Social Change and Youth Empowerment. Ashe, which is also a pun on a Yoruba word, Ashe means, um, Ashe is um, the logos in Yoruba. Ashe puts young activists on boards of trustees that serve youth and provides training and support to help build a cohes cohesive group of youth leaders of color who work across issues of um, race, geographical divide, things like that, class in Los Angeles. She is on the consulting board of several academic journals. She graduated from Amherst College, Phi Beta Kappa, magna cum laude, and received her PhD from Berkeley in Ethnic Studies. She's also working on two manuscripts, one entitled Dark Sentiment, Reading Black Women in the 19th Century, the other entitled Transgressive Desires, Representing Miscegenation and Homoerotics in 19th Century Literature and Culture, soon to be a major motion picture. <laughs> in addition, are you two going to speak together? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, in addition, she's joined by her colleague and co-conspirator co and collaborator, Reginald H. Pitts. Reginald Howard Pitts is a native of East Orange, New Jersey, and was educated in its public school system. He's an honor gradu honors graduate in history from Lincoln and received his master's degree in American history from Villanova and his Juris Doctorate from Rutgers. That's great. Early in his career, Mr. Pitts served as an assistant student historian and a park technician for interpretation at Morristown National Historical Park in Morristown, New Jersey. And it was, he was there as part of a cooperative education program with the National Park Service. Since reformulating his career as a professional, professional historian after a stint in the practice of law, Mr. Pitts has maintained an active interest in research pertaining to African American history, American urban history, and public history. During his eight and one half years with the John Milner Associates JMA services, Mr. Pitts conducted research on several projects in the Mid-Atlantic region primarily in New York City and in Philly, in the Upper South and throughout New England. While working as project historian for JMA, Mr. Pitts worked on the Foley Square project, including the African burial ground and the Five Point archaeological sites, as well as a cultural resources study of the Philadelphia Naval Complex and a similar survey of Governor's Island in New York Harbor. At the present time, as principal of Blanket Gene Genealogical and Historical Research Services of Elkins Park, Pennsylvania, Mr. Pitts performs genealogical and primary source his, um, historical research for a host of international, national, and local individual clients and institutions, including researching the history of the, African, the first African Baptist Church of South Philadelphia for their bicentennial celebration, which is scheduled for June of 2008. And I was so impressed with the um, research that he's done and, and the commitment that I asked him if he would be a non-resident fellow at the Du Bois Institute and uh, have engaged his services to continue the elusive search for one Hannah Crafts. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming to the Du Bois Institute my dear friend Gabrielle Foreman and my new friend Reginald Pitts.
Well, thank you all for coming out on a Friday afternoon. It's very good to see your beautiful faces. Um, we want to take a moment to thank the Du Bois Center and the Harriet E. Wilson Project for this invitation to come. And while we were searching for marriage licenses and death certificates that we finally found and pouring over decades worth of newspapers and letters, consulting city directories and census records, we were building on the field-changing discoveries of Henry Louis Gates, Jr., and following the amazing, amazing collective work of our kindred spirits in New Hampshire at the Harriet Wilson Project. We want to thank Skip not only for bringing us our NIG, but for his leadership in changing the face of 19th century American literature. I really wouldn't have a field to work in if it wasn't for your pioneering work, so thank you. We're also honored to share some time with Fern Cunningham, whose art gives life to public sculpture by adding the faces of dismembered black women, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. And we're so pleased to be in the presence of Wilson scholars and those whose scholarship or example has informed our work. And Brody here at Harvard, Barbara McCaskill, who is at Radcliffe, and Eva Legremon, who is in the audience today, um, are just uh, some examples of the many fine scholars who are doing this work. I say happy birthday. But of course, I'd like to mention today that um, Harry Wilson was born 180 years ago this week, um, 15th of March, um, Tuesday was her birthday. So a quick moment just to say happy birthday to Hattie. Without her, we wouldn't be here today. <laughs> In June 1867, four years after Harriet Wilson seemed to have disappeared from the historical record, William Cooper Nell, the black Bostonian known for his abolitionist work, his historical writings, and his successful efforts to integrate Boston's public schools, wrote to his friend Amy Post, the Rochester reformer. He had found but little opportunity to attend the New England Convention or the Spiritualist meeting, he reported, and knew nothing of the colored medium, Mrs. Wilson. It may be some one of my acquaintances. Had Nell attended the two-day convention, we might know more about exactly what Mrs. H.E. Wilson, the eloquent and earnest colored trance medium, as the newspaper reported, had to say when she took the stage with A.J. Davis, as the Banner of Light referred to Andrew Jackson Davis, the most important author of the spiritualist movement. What we do know is that when she joined a community that from its podiums and in its platforms denounced, quote, the money power, a power that now despises the claims of northern labor as it once despised the prayer of the American slave, unquote, and that pled for the Indians as it had once done for the Negro, she found a welcome audience. Convention goers at that Boston meeting heard Mrs. Wilson, the colored speaker, give two addresses. When called to pl the platform for the second time, she delivered a fervent speech in favor of labor reform and the education of children. Those who attended the huge gathering later that summer in Pierpont Grove and Melrose would hear Mrs. Hattie Wilson of East Cambridge, the colored medium, speak again. Her address would incite thrilling interest and was at once an eloquent plea for the capacities of her race, the sentiment and philosophy of human brotherhood, and a timely and beautiful application of the idea of human progress. Now, Harriet E. Wilson of Milford, New Hampshire, left behind the poverty and broken health she encountered during the years she, in which she wrote Our Nick, was abandoned by her husband, lost her only son, and was interred as a county pauper in the Hillsbury County Poor Farm, still begs for a fuller explanation. But there is no question that she did just that. By 1867, Hattie E. Wilson reappeared right here in East Cambridge, moved across the Charles River to Tremont Street in Boston, and spent the next 30 years in Boston South End, while she traveled throughout New England and as far as Chicago, giving lectures, singing in quartets, and enjoying what seems to have been a full and active private and public life. And once known as our Nick to the New Hampshire family, to whom she was informally indentured as a child, Boston's colored medium outlived every person in whose service her health was broken. Instead of fading away, as Hattie will mention a poem that was published in a local town paper where she grew up in, she survived to see the 20th century. Called Hattie E. Wilson in many public documents, and on her death certificate and on her gravestone, which we just saw, uh, she was ultimately overcome by the exhaustion that characterized her years in service. But she didn't submit to this initiation the listed cause of her death until she was 75 years old. 
Our friends placed announcements in Boston and Quincy papers. They advertised the time and location and even the runs from South Station that would bring welcome relatives and friends to celebrate her life and passing. Now, Hattie Wilson died on the 28th day of June, 1900, and she's buried in Mount Wallace Cemetery in Quincy. We got to go visit her again just before we came here, this time with the wonderful women of the Harriet Wilson Project to pay our respects this afternoon. Our research confirms that Mrs. H.E. Wilson, who filed for a copyright of, of our NIG, is indeed the same Miss Hattie E. Wilson of Boston. The death certificate um, that we found calls her Hattie E. Wilson and places her age as 75 years, 3 months, and 13 days, born in Milford, New Hampshire, to Joshua Green. The maiden name, which is new information, Joshua Green is, the maiden name and birthplace of her mother is left blank, and her race is listed there as African. Her second marriage certificate in September 29th in 1970 and all the, excuse me, 1870. Well, see, she really lived a long, long time. Yes, we just, we just missed her. <laughs> uh, that marriage certificate and all the, uh, all the women who um, are concerned with the statistics that they like to scare us with will like this because she married a man who was uh, 17 years her junior. Um, she says that she was born in Milford, New Hampshire, and the child of Joshua and Margaret Green. She marries John Gallatin Robinson. This was the young man's first marriage and the bride's second marriage. Here again, she's listed as being born in Milford, New Hampshire. Um, and although she is white on that death certificate, excuse me, on that marriage certificate, she's listed as white, the addresses that she lists correspond to the addresses that she uses in the spirit, in the banner of, uh, the banner of, help me out. The banner of life. Thank you. The Spiritualist newspaper was published on Cornhill in Boston, was in business for over 50 years. And had subscriptions in every state of the nation. And Canada. And, and in Canada and in the territories. Lord, I spent so many days with that paper. I think it's trauma that makes me forget its name. <laughs> Um, so that the names, the, the, her, her services are listed every week, and the addresses correspond to the address on her certificate. And that marriage certificate's address um, corresponds, again, with her being colored, right, listed as black in the banner of light, which lists that address every week. And so we have that confirmation. It's worth asking, or taking a moment to actually ask, why had he be attracted to spiritualism? And at the risk of speaking to an audience much more informed about the subject, perhaps, because Ambrody, of course, the author of Radical Spirit, Spiritualism, and Women's Rights in the 19th Century America, is here at the Divinity School, we might discuss the movement itself. Many people joined uh, spiritualist and spiritualism when they lost a child and the names of these folks are familiar names First Lady Mary Todd Lincoln New York Tribune editor Horace Greeley Amy and Isaac Post the famous abolitionists uh, feminists and reformers New York Supreme Court Judge John Edmonds who left his judgeship in order to join the spiritualist movement all became associated with spiritualism after the death of a child and spiritualism, as many of you know, was sweeping the country in the 1840s and the 1850s. It was a major, nearly ubiquitous 19th century movement that appropriated space for women's expression and leadership in religious, political, social, and medical reform. The movement was an heir to the mid-century religious awakenings that would spawn Christian science, Seventh-day Adventism, Mormonism, Mesmerism, etc. And like those who believed in phrenology and biometrics, spiritualism's adherents held that spirit's messages were conducted through electricity, linking it to scientific pro progress and the surge of discoveries that were then changing the way society understood both natural phenomena and itself. In their lecture halls, in their conventions, in their camp meetings that were attended by thousands of people. She herself lectured with Victoria Woodhull in front of a convention of 16,000 people, or at least that gathered 16,000 people. They discussed the larger concerns of women, um, of labor, and racial oppression. Before the Civil War, the movement was popular with many leading abolitionists. And after 1865, they took up the cause of the eight-hour workday, women's rights in marriage and childbearing, and Indian removal. And clairvoyant physicians challenged draconian practices, the overprescribing of toxic doses of purgatives, 
stimulants and narcotics such as opium and mercury, and rejected the medical establishment's restrictions on women because of their supposed inclination toward hysteria. Instead, they relied on homeopathic remedies. Um, so its adherents included familiar names of other folks besides the ones that we've listed already. Horace Greeley, historian George Bancroft, for those of us who have spent time at Berkeley, the library is named after him. Abolitionist and women's rights activist Angelina and Sarah Grimke, Sojourner Truth, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and William Lloyd Garrison, among others, were all spiritualists. And to that pantheon, we can now add Harriet Wilson. Yes, indeed. Just to mention, too, that Harriet was very well known as a psychic healer, um, a clairvoyant healer, and she would also post in the Banner of Light her um, business card essentially saying that she made house calls. Her office hours were from 9 to 5, but she'd be more than happy to visit you in the home and smooth the pill of the sick. Anything you wanted, she was able to do it for you. That was our Hattie. Now, while much of our research eliminates Wilson's later life and the ways which it intersections with 19th century social and religious movements, as you've heard, we've also identified information about her parents which raise as many questions as they answer. For example, we have her father's name listed as Joshua Green. We also have um, legal documents which state that her name was Harriet Adams. So there's kind of a disconnect here, as you can figure. We, and we are still working on that question. We don't know, for example, if Har um, Harriet Adams was, the name, was named for her mother. We do know, though, that her mother's name was Meg and Margaret, actually, and she could be either be Margaret Adams or she could be Margaret Smith. Now, we found more about a Margaret Smith, and, but we haven't found much about a Margaret Adams, and we haven't found much about poor Joshua Green, other than the fact that Harriet firmly believed in him, and he actually came to her, as to mention. Um, one day in 1870, she spoke before a crowd of fellow worshipers, spiritualists, and told the story of how her father came back to visit her. She's in, in bed, asleep, and all of a sudden, a gentle voice awakes her, and she looks up, and it's her dad. And he essentially tells her that you were brought here to, for a higher purpose, to a greater plane. You are obviously going to be a spiritualist. And she essentially said, no, 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 no. Goes back to sleep. The next night, as she says, one of her classmates, long since gone to the other side, returns and speaks with her just as naturally as if he had just dropped in off the street. And then her father comes back, speaks of her in loving, tender tones, tells about her early life and his life before he met White. And as she said, from then on in, he was a constant companion with her and essentially guided her through the rest of, the, the rest of her times and on the earth. And as she went before all of the um, crowds that she spoke before, of course, he was always there with her. So it's a comforting thought to believe that her beliefs aided her in that way. This, no, please. No. And there's even less definitive, if more intriguing, information available about her mother, um, whom she may have inadvertently followed to Boston many years after she was abandoned. The personal claim made in the opening chapter, Mag Smith, My Mother, is more suggestive than readers once thought because it ve very well may be literal. Indeed, if Margaret Ann Smith, a 27-year-old New, uh, New Hampshire woman who died in Boston, corresponds to the lonely Mag Smith, whose stories our Nig first relates, then soon after she left Mif Milford, Harriet's mother died much in the same way that she had lived. After her husband's death, Mag, as many Margarets were often called, descended into a darkness, casually taking on one of her husband's partners as a lover and engaging in tense domestic scenes that became familiar and trying. Many of us are familiar with this language. Before the couple decided to relieve themselves of her child and leave town to find work, um, and this, she, had, she had hooked up with uh, one of her, her former husband's friends at this point, and we suspect that his name actually could have been Adams as well. That's one of the possible explanations. And they're nasty, boy. They're barking at people and growling and snarling. This is the language, actually, that Wilson herself uses. Mag is morose and revengeful and subjects to fits of desperation and bursts of anger, during which she utters curses too fearful to repeat. 
Margaret Ann Smith and the black man with whom she resided seemed to have lived in much the same way, drinking heavily and quarreling all the time. And one day he beat her severely, severely and she didn't survive. The March 27th, 1830 Farmer's Cabinet, this is the paper that covered the area in which Wilson grew up, reports Smith's death in detail. Margaret Ann Smith, black, late of Portsmouth, New Hampshire, about 27 years, was found dead in the room of a black man with whom she lived on South Hack Street, that's how they call it, Boston last week. The verdict of the coroner's jury was that she came to her death from habitual intoxication. It appears that she and the man had quarreled, both being intoxicated and he had beaten her severely, but that the immediate cause of her death was drinking half a pint of raw rum. Stay away from that liquor. Both newspapers confirm the death, but add no information. Boston newspapers confirm the death, but add no information. Now, this is interesting, right? She dies in Boston. But the Boston papers confirm the death, but add no information. It's completely unembellished. The Boston Patriot lists one death that week from intemperance. And the New England Patriot, presumably the other possible cabinet source, the cabinet source cites the Patriot, doesn't even note the death. Indeed, the cabinet's coverage is much more detailed than the papers in the city in which the death occurred, leaving one to wonder why a small regional New Hampshire paper would cover the death of a woman from Portsmouth who died in Boston unless she had recent local connections. The announcement corresponds to our Nick's story. Mag was not born in Singleton, as Milford is called, but relocates there and has just left. Yet the newspaper accounts that, that, that list all of this lists Mag Smith as black, and this, of course, raises intriguing questions. Was the racial attribution simply a mistake, which is possible? Was Mag Smith labeled black because of her socially and sexually compromised status, her intimate connections with black men? And what do we make of Arnig's own challenging play with its readers' racialized expectations? If we remember, of course, Mag's racial, de racial designation isn't revealed. She could very well be a light-skinned black woman until the very last paragraph of the first chapter that tells her story. You may preach a dozen sermons on the power of amalgamation. Want is a more powerful philosopher and preacher, right, she says. And that's the moment we find out that Mag is actually black, that this is an amalgamated relationship. Her light skin, her diction tells us very little. Her straight hair tells us nothing, right, particularly when we consider the tropes of 19th century American literature and particularly African American literature. So what do we make of Wilson's play and then this corresponding historical moment? You want to go ahead? Please. In the first chapter title, the author claims Mag Smith as my mother. And it's in a text otherwise told entirely in the third person. Likewise, Wilson claims the story, Our Nig, by Our Nig, as her own. Now, although neither the text's importance nor as its authenticity is dependent on for truth as shifting, situated, and ultimately unrecoverable as any narrative truth claims are, our new evidence both broadens and bolsters earlier findings that from the beginning to the end, uh, with very few exceptions, uh, we do find that Wilson's narrative corresponds with the historical record. Now, if Mag Smith is Margaret Ann Smith, she did move south from Portsmouth, New Hampshire, to Milford, and leaving a few friends that she possessed to seek asylum through strange among strangers. Now, in our nig, Jim, he boards chief with the Cooper that employs him. And the 1820 and 1830 census show, or enumerations do show, that one Timothy Blanchard, or Pete Green, in the book, was the owner of the Cooperage, and he was also one of Milford's two black heads of household, rather prosperous um, member also. Now, he also boarded other free men of color, one of whom was almost certainly um, Wilson's father, Joshua Green. Indeed, one of Timothy Blanch Blanchard's nieces, they lived in Salem, Massachusetts, or even his own daughters by Dorcas Hood, could easily have been the other little colored girl, the favorite playmate of Fredo's, who went missing with her directly after Fredo overheard that she was to be given away. Moreover, as White has established, the portrayal of the county home that's found in our nig corresponds almost exactly to the descriptions and town records for the support of the poor. Now, our nig's story does overlap with the closing testimonials that function to authenticate its claims. And again, new evidence confirms the details both our nig and its appendix documents do relate. Indeed, while the future beauty black magnate 
Madam C.J. Walker, was still little Sadie Breedlove, playing in the mud of the Mississippi Delta, Wilson had started a fruitful business selling hair products. Now, freed from her indenture and faced with poverty and poor health, our Nick reports that a friend provided Fredo with a valuable recipe, and it restored gray hair to its former color. So this, is, this is a woman who knows what she's doing, right? She could have made money in the 21st century. <laughs> she definitely will survive. Now, availing herself of this great help, she has been quite successful, but again, her health is again failing. And she has felt herself obliged to resort to another method of procuring her bread, that of writing an autobiography. Now, we do know that sometime between 1856 and 1860, and possibly even later, Mrs. H. E. Wilson sold hair regenerator and hair dressing to bo in bottles that were made in the nearby town of Manchester, New Hampshire. Exactly. And Harriet Wilson refers to Arnega's sketches or narrations, while the author of the closing testimonial from which Reg just read urges others to buy the autobiography. In addition to the ways it brilliantly incorporates conventions associated with the novel, Arnig so closely corresponds to the historical record that it lays claim to being the only narrative we now know of written by a black indentured servant in the North. Arnig provides a rare sketch of what it was like to be a poor Northern-born free woman, engaging issues of gender, labor, and Northern racism and indifference. Arnig is one of the very few narratives written by a free Northern-born black at all. Yet, even as we recover the direct correspondences between Wilson's text and her life, we might do well to heed critic Julia Fabi's caution and many other people's caution that the appreciation of the literariness of early African American and women's writings is often overshadowed by the emphasis on the socio-historical context. The census records, newspaper sightings, city directory listings, marriage death certificates that confirm the facts described in Arnig and that legitimize the book's claim as a singular autobiography in no way diminishes its achievement as a novel of extraordinary complexity. Arnig is prototypical of black antebellum writing and its tendency to weave together factual and fictional and fictive conventions or autobiographical and novelistic strategies. It's exceptional, however, because as a hybrid, it meets and challenges so many of the conventional generic expectations of each individual form. Indeed, Arnig functions as an autobiography characterized by its clever novelistic qualities just as surely as it's a brilliant novel that makes autobiographical claims. After daring to write a book that is both the first black woman's novel and a singular autobiography of an indentured servant, Wilson continued to challenge convention and to exceed the expectations of those who called her Arnig. As a child, Wilson had been scoffed at for her attempts to find spiritual comfort and reproached by her mistress for turning pious nigger who might expect to preach to white folks. As a woman, she did just that. So many early black women writers like Pauline Hopkins, the editor, singer, and prolific novelist, who was working as a stenographer when she perished in a fire, and like Nella Larson, who almost disappeared in New York, living her later lives at later years as a lonely and unhappy nurse, provide unhappy endings. Alice Walker, as we know, had to find and then put a gravestone on Zora Neale Hurston's unmarked grave. But Hattie overcame her years as a tortured servant in slavery shadow, she escaped from the poorhouse, and she never turned back. <laughs> she threw birthday parties at her house that went on well past midnight, and these are reported in the press. Uh -huh. Until dawn. She gives, she gives parties for her on the day of her son's birthday, excuse me, death date, on, a, on the day of her son's death date, and then moves everybody over to a hall next to her house to hang out until they get tired. <laughs> She gave playful, signifying lectures from podiums all over the North and sung her way in quartets into the 20th century. Her book is both a remarkable self-portrait and a masterpiece to blow, placed in a panorama of 19th century social movements. This edition fully, or not quite fully, but almost, restores that canvas. Now we can look closely at the detailed brush strokes of Wilson's life and work and also step back to appreciate the major forces that so colored 19th century life and culture and Wilson's own literary and historical choices. Thank you. Thank you. We want to take some questions, but we also want you to know that we're about to unveil um, the drawings for an amazing sculpture 
um, that is, are, is going to be in the, centen the Centennial Park. Bicentennial. Bicentennial Park um, in Milford, New Hampshire. And it's going to be the first sculpture ever of an individual African American in New Hampshire. The Harriet Wilson Project is raising funds and is doing all kinds of amazing nonprofit work um, and uh, throwing lectures. Um, and hosting lectures and lecture series in addition to having Gates come to New Hampshire in order to raise New Hampshire's awareness. It's the, uh, the, the state that has the second fewest uh, number of African Americans in the whole union to raise their awareness of, uh, of their own native daughter. Fern Cunningham is here with us, as is her husband, Alvin Terry, a jazz musician from the area. And Fern is... Um, has been elected through the work of the spirits and the Harriet Wilson Project to, uh, to be the person who's going to give us a rendition of, of Harriet Wilson. She is an accomplished sculpture with a long history of black women's artistic production. Her mother actually has a gallery and uh, was trained with Lois Jones at Howard. Um, and she has done work on A. Philip Randolph and on Harriet Tubman and has dealt with some of the same kind of uh, complexities of trying to make sure that she can give life and face and voice in this instance uh, to African-American women who have been disremembered. So she's here with us today. She is from South, or at least Harriet Tubman is from South Boston. She's a longtime resident of uh, Roxbury and Dorchester, if I remember correctly. Um, and, uh, and she's here with us to unveil some of her drawings for that sculpture today. Do you want to do that now, and then we'll take questions? Yeah, we that. Introduce Jerry Ann. Ah, and Jerry Ann Bogus, the driving force behind the Harriet Wilson Project, the woman whose labor of love and energy and vision with all of the other women that she has gathered around her has um, managed to do almost the impossible, which is to get New Hampshire to celebrate with joy and thanksgiving a history that they really wanted to deny and forget and bury. It's not easy to come up, right, against all of these folks who would rather not remember the history of a family who treats people like slaves or a slave in their own town, a town, mind you, which was really an abolitionist stronghold. Right? They had huge conventions in 1843 bringing all kinds of abolitionists. They're the hosts of the Hutchinson family singers, and although they think right, that Tiny Tim, is that right? Came Tom, through, Tom Thumb, Tom, Tom Thumb. I'm sorry, I don't yes. know that history. Oh, yes. Came through. Frederick Douglass came through. Not all right? Garrison <laughs> came through. Many people came through their house at the same time that just two miles away, Harriet Wilson was being treated as an indentured servant in the same town. At the same time, they were celebrating singing the yokes and the fetters from the limbs of our people, as Frederick Douglass said of the Hutchinson family singers. You have families who are related to them, who travel with them just two miles away. This is a history that New Hampshire was not eager to receive. But women got together, right? And Jerry Ann can name some of the other people who are here to make sure that they actually encounter that history in substantive ways. And this sculpture, again, is going to be the first of an African-American individual in the state. So we really do really appreciate the energy and the time and the vision of all of the Harriet Wilson Project. Can everybody stand from the Harriet Wilson Project? Come on. Really, come on, stand up. Come on. Stand up. Well, the Harriet Wilson Project, please, will please stand. I would like to just say a few words about uh, the design. Um, I teach a lot of students at the Park School in Brookline, and many of them are biracial. And, it, it, you know, for a long time I was studying their faces and trying to think about different faces that might express the character that I read so much about in the book. And I did finally settle on, on one of the faces, and that's the face that I've chosen for the sculpture. And uh, yeah, that's oh, wow. she was <laughs> <laughs> Yes. She did actually describe herself as pretty. 
of several times in the book. But she also admitted that she was very feisty and that she had a will of her own. And this particular student uh, is definitely very feisty with a will of her own. And we frankly argued all week before I did this, <laughs> before I chose her as, as the face. Now I'm going to uh, unveil a smaller one, a smaller drawing of the sculpture itself. And um, then I'll, I'll just mention a few things about it. Um, this piece, I have a, a fondness for stairs and the, the meanings of stairs. And I don't know how many of you know my sculpture of Harriet Tubman. It's called Step on Board, and it's, in, it's on Columbus Avenue in the South End. And in that sculpture, they're coming down a set of stairs because um, many people don't know the story behind that particular sculpture. But it was a moment in her life when she had uh, gone to a house that was supposed to be a safe house, and she brought the whole group up the stairs and knocked on the door only to be told that the man had been arrested and they were turned away. So they all had to come down the stairs and, you know, begin their flight again. And that was the moment that I was capturing in that particular sculpture. In this one, I was thinking of the stairs in a way that was twofold, really. Partially, I was thinking of Harriet as a young girl being brought up the stairs to the house, the strange house of these strange people, and being deposited there, and how that must have felt to her. And then the feeling of, of being out in the world with her son and having him ill, he's behind her, and yet, there they are in the stairs again, and she's, she's again trying to go upstairs and find entry into a world to find safety for her son, to find a way to help him to live. And she's extending the book before her and holding him behind her as she tries to comfort him and bring him along. And I included a, a set of uh, working chimes that would extend downward from the book and, and those chimes would have designs on them. Some of them would be th um, three-dimensional relief sculptures, and some of them would be actual words, text from the book, so that people could be drawn in and explore all of that. So um, I prefer sculpting to drawing, but I've done this for you so that you can see what's on my mind. Great. Okay. I think it's only off for it by a year. Huh? Six and five. It's, it's off by a year. In the book, she's six, and here she's five. Where she's five. Right. So how does she know? This is what, when, you know, the, several of my colleagues mm -hmm. you know, examined your work. The only thing, everybody keeps coming back to this claim. But you, you modify I mean, you um, qualify it. Mm -hmm. Yes. And it's a curious juxtaposition of facts. But so why did they call me and said, but how would she know? How would she, how would she how know would, what? How would the girl, Harriet, know about Mag Smith, all these details, all these years later when she writes? When Mag Smith dies in 1830, how old is the, the girl Harriet? Five or six. About five, five or six, six yes. Yeah. So she's five or six, she wouldn't know who told her, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. You know, it's, it's, it's a great juxtaposition. It makes for a great story. It's a great footnote. Mm -hmm. And then the Joshua Green, the Adams, are, you know, all questions that we all still have to figure out. What about Carter G. Woodson? And Ray June and I were talking on the phone about this. Mm -hmm. These people in Free Negro Heads of Households, which is Carter G. Woodson's mm -hmm. thing, are they in there? No. No. 
So why not? Did They're not heads of households. Not, none of them is. A, well, one person you mentioned was. Here. Well, Timothy Blanchard, Timothy Blanchard. Um, is actually there. He he is there. Um, in Milford. In Milford, and he was born in the nearby town of Wilton. His dad was a Revolutionary War veteran and an ex-slave from Massachusetts, and very well-known veterinarian. Um, Tim and the rest of the family moved into Milford, and he set himself up in business. His dad still ran the on um, the veterinary, and Tim set himself in business as a cooper, mm -hmm. as along with being a farmer, was rather prosperous. Also, did very well for himself. He would appear. He paid taxes. He donated the land for the local school in his district, and he was a solid citizen, um, had, giving to the world eight kids. Also, so he's very well documented, and he does appear in census records. And he also is also noted as hot, um, employing or at least boarding a number of other Free black men. Mm -hmm. So, so whom you said was probably just yeah. exactly, right. okay. which is actually the claim that Barbara A. White made as well, is that the father probably was that. Right. I'd love to ask uh, to ask you to clarify your question so that I make sure I understand it because um, there are obviously novelized aspects of the of the oh, sure. of the environment. Sure. That's clear. I mean, no one no one is going to argue that. In fact, we all celebrate that. Oh, sure. um, and the um, sort of dialogue in the beginning is clearly something that she wouldn't remember. That's no, that's fictionalized. That's clearly fictionalized. So if in fact we acknowledge that to be the case. And um, her mother's name is Mag Smith. Why couldn't she remember at six that her mother's name was Mag Smith? She could remember it, but the details, it seemed like you were saying, this fictionalized person, mm -hmm. what happened to the fictionalized character was quite a lot like what happened to the real life Mag Smith. Right. right. It's just, what's your source? That's all. Oh, well, the, the source is actually our NIG, which is the source for much of the work that we do. No, no, what was the, the girl Harriet's source about? It could oh, very easily. Wait, wait, wait. Hold on, let me, let me, let me, let me. Okay, well, let me, let me start off for a second. Okay. Milford is, as now, as was then, a very small town. And one thing about Milford also, the majority of folks, at least a good third to a quarter of the residents there, were related to one family, the Hutchinson family, either by blood or by marriage. And being a small town, most of whom went to the same churches and pretty much saw each other. Everybody knew each other's business. Now, Tim Blanchard lived until Harriet was 14 years old, and his family was still in the area for quite a while. Um, the Haywards themselves were all in um, Milford for a long time, even afterwards, and those folks who were um, friends, we'll just say, of Harriet, would have probably known all the story. And if they didn't know the story, they knew what they thought was the truth, and they wouldn't so tell them about it. Oh, well, there's, there's, a couple, there's a couple of things going on, sure. it seems to me. One is that um, no one's claiming that she's necessarily black. Newspapers make mistakes all of the time. And the yes. question that is raised, of course, is, is the fact that someone is having a, a, a sexual relationship, an intimate relationship, where they're drinking and living with a black man enough for a newspaper to suggest she's black? That could be signifying. That doesn't have to be historical. Right? Yeah, sure. But the paper says she was black. Yeah, but, okay. but, but the second marriage certificate says as well that Harriet is white. Right. And she marries a white man, so they suggest she's white. Right. So the, the kind of shifting um, racial classifications. We, we know about it. I mean, that's yeah, right, exactly. absolutely. But that also. Making mistakes all the time. Right. Yeah, Right, and people, yeah. and people, said, and sure. people, and signif it, and people signify, right. right? And the very fact that it shows up in the Milford paper in such detail right. suggests that they're trying to make a point about Margaret Ann Smith nonetheless. Mm -hmm. Here's this woman who lived in our town, and of course this is all speculation. Oh, it's great, it's great exactly. Stanley. It's great copy, and it's great copy in a town where we've been calling this woman, you know, out of her name for a long time, right? Mm -hmm. So here we are, not only do we get to call her out of her name, we get to suggest again that she's black, because she'd been drinking consorting with black men, right, doing all kinds of things. So the question that, the, the interesting conceptual question for me is about how sexual and racial assignation is permeable, right, and the way that social and sexual constructs function in, a, in relationship to the historical record and in relationship to a signifying record. Well, we know that somebody is white in her parentage. Right. Or, or very, very light. Right. right. Because she's a mulatto. Right. Right. No. Real life Harry Wilson is mixed because she can pass for white. Well, 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 yes and no. Harry I mean, Adams. yes, yes and no. Okay. I mean, we assume that we assume that that is true, and we're not making any claims that that is not true, right? right? But nonetheless, all of us know light-skinned people who have two black parents. I mean, lots sure. of folks know that. No, but I mean, but if you're 
you're born in the 1820s, mm-hmm. it's not too far back <laughs> when there was an actual white person there. Sure. Yeah, but that's true of very many black folks. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's so. Uh, I, I guess so. So we. But no one, I think, is actually contesting the fact that, Ma- that when we find Mag Smith or uh, her mother, that person is probably going to be white. But that's based much more on the um, veracity of the rest of the claims that Harriet Wilson makes. For many, I mean, many of us thought narratively, call that into question narratively. Right. Um, but now that we have this kind of, you know, sort of much broader and much deeper uh, correlation between the historical record and the claims that she makes, right. then we have a, a, you know, sort of, it would be very odd, and we'd have to, to sort of read that in a different way if she weren't white. The newspaper is either signifying or is wrong. And that's just, you know, that's sort of an easy answer. And just to mention, too, the Boston papers, when they list Margaret Ann Smith, right. they don't list her as colored. Most black folks who died and actually made, had an obituary that made into a mainstream paper were listed colored. Yeah. Um, but, the, but she's, but, not, really but she's listed. not listed as colored. The only place that lists her as black is her hometown paper back in Middleford, well, Amherst at that time, but the okay, hometown yes. paper mentions it. And she's, hard, and she's hardly listed. She's just listed, her, na- her name is listed. Right. Or she's listed as an in, you know, sort of a death intemperance, death by intemperance. She's hardly mentioned at all. Yes. Let me ask you a, what, one, a final comment about the, sculpt, the sculpture and... Uh, and then one final question, and we'll open it up. You know, it was because, you know from my introduction, that it was because of the death certificate of the little boy. That's how we really found it. I mean, that's how we found it, the most details about it. So I'm so glad you could commemorate that's what you do. Yeah. that little boy. And for those of you who haven't read the book, she ostensibly wrote the book to raise money to get the little boy out of the county court, courthouse, court farm. Uh, yeah, so that's, I, was, I was asked to just her, but reading the story, I just... I just couldn't leave the boy out. No, it was great. I'm, I'm really touched that you did that. Yeah. But why do you think, it's what I'm always asked. Mm-hmm. The students ask every year mm-hmm. I teach Saturday, and they, why nobody wrote about the book? Yeah. Why did Frederick Douglass, why, you know, in, 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 in the 1830s in the on, from the time the Liberator started publication in, in 1831, every abolitionist black newspaper wrote about everything black, any act of intellection at all, even if it looked like an act of intellection mm-hmm. or art, an artistic achievement, anything they could use to refute the claims that black people were genetically uh, inferior. You know? Hustle and it. Hustle and it. It's that precisely. And I think the answers that you give, that um, the, the, the hated epithet is, is scary, that a, um, a positive rendition of a, an interracial um, marriage, and then, of course, the fugitive slave. And let me, and let me back up. And I assume almost everybody has read it, and I hope that that assumption was correct. Um, yeah, I will. I will. That was a comma. That <laughs> was a comma. Um, so her husband ends up being a huckster, um, and he is passing himself off as a fugitive slave. And at this point, the London papers um, have announcements so he's, he's a fake fugitive. Like, he, he gets it. He gets it that, um, that hungry abolitionists will, and that's what she calls them, hungry abolitionists are eager to tell his story, are eager to hear these humbug stories, and so he plays the part, right? Um, much like a rapper today, you know, these middle-class rappers who write, you know, don't come from where they are, um, right? You know, this is this brother's game, right? He's a, we could talk about that trajectory of performance. Um, and so, um, and that's what he's doing, and then he, and he goes off um, and abandons her and goes to sea, which is actually what lots of African-American men did who couldn't um, support their families because of the racism um, and the lack of opportunities and employment in uh, the North. He goes off to sea, and then he dies there. But, of course, uh, in London, papers are advertising, uh, you should be careful, right, that these fake fugitives are coming over. And um, in the Liberator also. And in the Liberator. People closer to home were running into these guys who would essentially say, well, I am Samuel Ringgold Ward. And they look at you and say, like, you're too light. He's the darkest man I ever saw. And so all of a sudden, then they'd write letters, and letters would come back. And by the time the letters would return, they were long gone. You know, they, um, right be- in fact, right before we did hear about Tom Wilson, you would go through the Liberator. They have article after articles, letters from Providence, Rhode Island from Boston, from New York, from Philly. Watch out for so-and-so. 
he claims to be a slave, but he's not, you know, and, and on and on like that. And you've written about cases, right, where yeah. that has been the, the case as well. James, James, James that's yes, right. exactly. That's right, it, and, and it is fascinating. So these are novelists, as you point out in your article, right, but, but not fugitive slaves. So um, of, I think you answered the question well, and I don't think there's any new information that really sheds light on that. Questions, comments? Thank you. Which other text did you have in, in mind? Yeah, particularly in the 19th century, right? Heroic slave, Clotel, Blake even, right? Who sort of plays with Placido and the latter conspiracy in Cuba, right? And also plays with John Brown coming up to Canada. All of that is, you know, sort of uh, rooted in um, being authorized um, by a historical, um, by, by a historical material history in some way. I mean, I think in some ways, um, for literary analysis, this is a, um, and we all know this, is a, uh, uh, a fake um, and uninteresting uh, opposition, autobiography novel. We've already dealt with lots of those questions. When I talk to my sophisticated, interesting friends who are historians, they want to know why they should incorporate this book right, into their courses. And um, and they actually do, and I would love to hear. I see uh, some of the some, you know some historians whose work um, <laughs> uh, mine is built on another in other contexts here in the room as well. Um, but they they actually want to know what does this tell us about um, the historical record and the lives of, of free indentured um, servants. Um, and I think it's important for that reason to show the way that the um, generic interplay functions at the same time as there is. Um, a real kind of true, a, a true correlation with the historical record. I don't know if that answers your question, but it's why it's emphasized for me. Otherwise, the question in some ways is settled, right? Here we have an inc incredibly sophisticated hybrid um, that is functioning in relationship to trying to change a historical outcome, right? And does so in ways that I call simatextual in, in other instances, right? That it both functions um, in one instance to tell a story that is palatable to certain audiences. And then if you know the history, right, if you actually know the history, and I'm thinking now of people like um, Amelia Johnson's Clarence and Corinne, later texts in the 1890s, um, and even Arnig, if you can pick up on certain um, literary tropes um, and histories of representation, then you know that um, the, the author and the text is also um, signifying and playing with different sets of expectations which lead audiences to different expect to, to different conclusions. Let me give you an example so that it makes it clear. If in fact you think Mag is um, is black as a reader, because Mag Smith, my mother, cannot possibly uh, produce a child who is anything but Mag has to be black in order to produce a black child if your expectations, right, are that Mag Smith, my mother, right? is, um, is in, in concert with the 19th century expectations of racial production, right? If that's the truth, then when you get to his, his wife, his treasure, a white wife in the second chapter, all of a sudden, all of the racial assignations you've made about the grotesque, about her snarling, about her giving away her child, about relationship to maternity and motherhood, right, have to be turned on their head. Now, if in fact you can read this as possibly a mulatto character, right, because you're used to reading the tropes of 19th century African American literature, then you have a different set of expectations when that move is made, right? So you have what I call simatextuality, depending on both the literary tropes with which you're familiar, and then in later texts, the historical um, sort of set of assumptions references, et cetera, with which you're familiar. And those would, you know, and Iola Lee Roy would work with Ida B. Wells, et cetera. Yeah. I don't know if that helps, but. 
Yes. All black folks are. All, all black folks who, who can pass are clever enough to do that. I, I'll never forget when, and I've passed once in my life. Really? Oh, yeah. Was it fun? No. No. It was humiliating, but I put my Laura Ashley dress on and smoothed my hair back and went to that courtroom in, in Massachusetts. My goodness. It's good to see you. Um, and went to and went to that to that courtroom and uh, and and told them I was an early graduate of Amherst College and please drop the charges that that white motherfucking racist police officer had put you know trumped up against me. So I think the answer is yes. I mean all all black people, all light skinned black people, and all black people are are sort of um, smart enough to be able to pass. Oh, Saul, I wonder what you're thinking. Look at your face. In various registers, right? Not just for black or white, but for, for class, across class issues, origin, religion, um, you know, background, um, you know, sort of that kind of double consciousness in a performative way is something that we have always, you know, you need to know how to do in order to survive. Um, now, whether or not you choose to do it or whether or not you choose, and I think that, but I'm not sure that we can suggest that she was passing. Um, I think that people make um, all kinds of assumptions and that you never know what a census record is, you know, a census taker is, is, um, is reading. Um, and, um, and if in fact she is um, white on the uh, 1870 census and the 1880 census, which she is, and she's colored in almost all of the newspaper renditions um, that, that sell her services, that tells us so little, right? We don't know whether or not it is the racism of the newspaper, right, that is that is insisting that she is um, labeled colored. If it's the ignorance or the assumption of the census taker, if she wasn't home and only her husband was, right, we, it's so hard to read intentions, performance, um, racial mobility into these historical um, sort of snapshots. Um, so I would say yes, but, but that, that has, has everything to do with my, my historical experience and, and not the way I would necessarily read um, her records. Do you want to say anything? Well, just to mention, too, that um, that, has been, that topic has been discussed in um, early fiction, of course. Um, Frank J. Webb's The Garys and Their Friends discusses the um, concept of passing, where the light-skinned African-American who stays on his side of the fence prospers, lives happily ever after, while the one that goes over the other side, of course, dies this terrible, horrible, lonely death. So, again, you can see how people tend to tend to balance these things. So, if you can get away with it, all power to you. They just look, wouldn't look at you as you walk by on the street. And if you didn't, people would just look at you and say, well, geez, why does he want to do that? But, you know, pretty much how it worked out. I think Harriet probably just, as you um, suggested, used it for her own ends. If she could get an, an edge on being black or white or even Indian, I guess, um, Native American, she would give it a good shot. But we don't know if we, we, don't, know, but but we, we don't know if that's the case. We guess. really don't know yet. Oh, we know she was. We know she was black. Right. We know, yeah. Where do you see that? Oh, oh, the text. The text. The text. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. What I'm interested in is her writerly sensibility in the way that the text manipulates that around man, right? Not around her. She's associated, I mean, her our nig is our nig. You know, so clearly connects the body to the social construct, right, of no matter how light you are, you are treated as our nig. I mean, that's, a, that's about property relations and northern racism, as you point out, you know, sort of very early. 
Um, so she may, it's really the, the way that she plays with her mother's body, right, around miscegenation, questions of miscegenation, and questions of, of want, right? And that's a lovely use of want. Want is a more powerful preacher and philosopher, right? Because it's in the register of desire and in the register of economics. And so that kind of moment where she plays with Mag's racial assignation is the one I think the text performs. And that has to do with her as a writer, right, or at that age, or, the, or what the text is performing. I mean, it may not be sort of Wilson at all, but it's with the, that's the text performance rather than her own by, you know, sort of personal performance, I think. Does that make sense? Yeah. That's also a, she was very, very white. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 And that's also a trope that comes straight out of slave narratives, right? So that we see in sort of um, slave m mistresses putting um, light skinned children who are also the children of their husbands out to make that difference. So she's also playing with a, a trope out of slave narratives. So you may, in fact, have some kind of biological reference, but it resonates in at least two registers there. Yeah, I was curious to think about that. I mean, going back all these years, um, you know, my history when I made this old is hundreds of thousands of copies. And it's, it's canonized. I mean, the book is in the Northern Anthology, it's this in the Northern Anthology, that. But there were people when I first made the That's play right. who said, this is impossible. And they said it was impossible um, primarily because, well, I mean, there was no, no record of it, nobody noticed. And it's so highly unlikely. How would nobody notice that this woman was sorting around Boston? Right? But the other reason was that she was too literate. Hmm. That she has epigraphs to these chapters. So we made a list of what, you know, I recreate her library. You know, and, it, and it's the kind of library that would be one shelf in, in a middle class, lower middle class um, American family home in, in the 1850s. But, you know, there's just presuppositions about black literacy. That we were just and Elizabeth, and Elizabeth McHenry has really exploded those yeah. working on that, yeah. You didn't, didn't read anything, or you didn't have that. The same thing in Hannah Crest. Right. How would she even know these? Well, easily, she would have read the book. Right. right. You know, she would have gotten a copy of Dickens. Dickens is serialized in Frederick Douglass' newspaper. Mm -hmm. and, and Ralph Ellison, and on the just back of his mind, is mm -hmm. Ellison says, this confirms my theory of free floating, floating literacy. And one of the reasons I'm so glad that you all um, published this stuff is that yeah, we are slammed up on Gary Wilson. <laughs> <laughs> There's nobody left who could possibly wonder about Gary Wilson's existence mm -hmm. and whether she, she published a book. Although, you know, Skip, I think you settled that question before we came along. Well, <laughs> I'd like to. But, you know, it's, uh, <laughs> but, you know, you found her whole life mm -hmm. afterwards. Mm -hmm. and then yeah. She's so much more interesting to me because of your work than she even wants to be. Mm -hmm. You know, my story ends with tragedy, death. Poverty. You know, she wastes away. Well, we, she's in Potter's Field somewhere. You have this feisty mama with an inventor and an entrepreneur, partier, so having these all night parties on the, the anniversary of her son. How much more interesting is the poor Marrying a man who's 18 years, right? Or, I like that. You know her junior. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. We're hoping. We haven't quite confirmed. <laughs> we have ideas and possibilities. We know that she was at places where pictures were taken. We just haven't been able to find the actual pictures. For example, a group of spiritualists were out at uh, Walden Pond. They, it was a great picnic area um, back in the 1870s. And it was a fellow named Simon Wing. Simon Wing was one of these homegrown New England types. He was a cross between Thomas Edison and Ralph Nader. Essentially, he was a very progressive inventor, and he was a very well-known photographer. He even ran for president of the Equal Rights Party in the 1880s. So he was the type of guy that he would have been very comfortable here in this room today. He took a panoramic picture of all the folks standing up next to the large pile of rocks that's in Thoreau's cabin um, in Cellar Hole. And in that picture is Harriet Wilson. The article mentioned that she was up there and gave a little speech. I 
I've got to find that picture. Most of Simon Wing's uh, photographs are around. He, he was prolific. He took pictures of anything and everything. You name it. If it moved, he took pictures of it. Can't find that picture. So we're hunting that one up. Can we can advertise for it? Not yet. We've been asking around and knocking on doors and trying to see how that goes first before we actually go out and start um, broadcasting. We oh, just. You'll find it. It's there. I hope so. It's there. You have to do. I, I mentioned this to Gabriel, but you have to do an essay about how you went about this. That's the supreme act of generosity, because then it will help everyone else go about. It. I think the other thing we need to do is I think we really do need to make sure that our literary students take courses in historical methodology Absolutely. and curriculum. No, and it takes a long time. And for those of us who have been working on Emma Dunham, Kelly Hawkins, and you know, and then this sort of, in, and the fact that she may be white comes up as you've done five years of primary research on her, right? Yes, I know you know. <laughs> That's, that's sisters black. I'm sorry. This, that, this story, this story is it is not over. Not even, <laughs> this not one is not over. <laughs> yeah, we think she actually may be Cape Verdean, and then the question of again the different registers into which people fit in the moment of. Oh, seriously. Yes. Uh, Adam and Kelly Hawkins. We've been working on it. So, but you know, but it is a. Uh, you said some evil things, Skip. Huh? You said some evil. That's a good. But those are interesting books. I don't care who wrote them. Those are interesting books. Oh yeah, right. There you go. What I said, which is true, is that she will have much more um, critical attention as a black woman than she ever would as a as a white woman in the church. What are the ramifications for that statement? Huh? What are the ramifications for that? Can you can you unpack that statement for us? What does that mean well, for the kind of white woman in the major figure about whom scholars are sitting around arguing why she didn't put any black characters in or not. Because we only have a, you know, half a dozen mm -hmm. black women writing fiction in the novel. But we have so few novels that actually deal with interracial groups of women in, in, in the 19th century, no matter who they're written by. No, and if, in fact, that's written by a white woman, that's it. I mean, I, look, I want her to be black, and she looked black. She's black. All right, you know, so. But that's actually something to unpack, too, right? As, um, but well, it seems. Right, but but you, I'm not in her she well, <laughs> <laughs> and and you were honest enough to say that in print. <laughs> well, look, you know, look, I'm not going to spend five years doing primary research on a, on a white woman writer either. But none, but since I have, <laughs> but I actually, and actually, I don't think that's true, Skip, because you went and bought our nig because you thought our nig was written by a white, a possibly by a white person. And you were interested, and you were interested in racist depictions of African Americans. And I think we actually also need to be interested in utopian visions of multi. And and there are two. I mean, these two young women are sent off to nigger heaven in Four Girls at Cottage City, and they have hair that can't be combed. And you know, the Dare sisters are named Garnet Dare and Victoria. I mean, Victoria Earl is a name. Wait, what are we doing right now? We're having that conversation. I want you to talk Getting about things started. Yes, sir. Uh, so, will you find them lots of examples of lots of references to Harry Wilson and the work that other scholars in doing on spiritualism that African Americans or people who do African American literature haven't been? It's all in the primary. It's all in the primary, it's all in the primary all material. The primary. It's all in the primary she material. material. She's speaking before 15,000 people. Primary material. Prime, it, yeah. yeah. Um, the, That's not surprising. Yeah. It's um the there weren't a lot of African Americans in the um, spiritualism at that particular time. We can name maybe about five That's major that. players in that particular setup at that time. And as it is too, the study of spiritualism as a social uh, movement is really just getting off the ground. There haven't been many books written about it. There have been a few good ones that have come out in the last few years. So things are still um, percolating in that department. Hopefully, you'll hear more about that and Harriet. The primary materials sources in that are very interesting. There's only one run of the second journal, the second major journal at the Newberry, and they don't even know it's the only run that they have until I told them, "Look, this is—you've got to preserve this better." It's not microfished. It's the only run. It's crumbling. So you know, you've, 
that's one of the things that is is happening in relationship to to to, um, to spiritualism. Um, the other thing is, I think we need to take it much more seriously as a social movement, and it is really disregarded so often because of its associations with seances, etc. And, and in fact, people were worried when Harriet Wilson was associated with this movement that this might actually, in some way, diminish her stature. Um, so this is a, a kind of a question we need to bring up to the forefront and think about um, why there's so few black people in spiritualism and what it means when they're functioning in those spheres. Yeah. William Cooper Nellon and uh, and spiritualism is a great dissertation. Thanks, Sam. It's been a, a real privilege. These two scholars have come here and share the results of their very, very important discoveries. I, I can't uh, think of a better way to spend my first day of freedom. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> let's give it up for Gabriel.